big, the big thing is that, that what got me into the industry was being as a, an educational director for the, uh, well, I started a store in Pittsburgh with Maddie and Eddie Shiner. We started it because we wanted to make a studio. And from that studio, some great players, well, Sammy took lessons there, all kinds of people took lessons there that became very great players. Mm. But uh, we started it for, for so that the school kids, I convinced these two guys who were teaching only pro top pros to work with school kids. Is that right? And, uh, Smart idea. Boy, and they made my band, I'll tell you that. <laughs> I had my kids study with them. And in fact, uh, Wilmerding, the first year we did it, uh, the school said, have them come over and te teach in the school. They let them charge the kids for lessons. So that was a, that got me involved. <laughs> <laughs> well, tell me a little bit about your childhood. You, where did you grow up again? In McKeesport, Pennsylvania. Okay. And uh, uh, went to grade school there, and in high school, and then I went uh, to uh, Carnegie Tech. Mm. It was it's called now Carnegie Mellon, but it was Carnegie Tech. I'm getting a here. Maybe it's oh, it's this, this. Oh, maybe that's what it is. Okay, I'm sorry. And uh, then I uh, uh, graduated from there and then spent one year in Columbiana County, Ohio, teaching one room schoolhouses. <laughs> <laughs> you should try that some. 19 of them I had, and I had to visit them once in a week. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I wore the What's, what's the thing on the, on the bottom of a car? The, uh, oh, the tread? No, no, on the bottom of the automobile. Oh. I wore that out. Really? The roads were made of uh, uh, slag. <laughs> 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 or flat, let's say it that way. And uh, when I traded that car in, I wanted to know what I did with it. <laughs> but anyway, uh, that was my experience, first experience teaching. But I taught no instrumental work there. Oh, is that right? Then I went to... Uh, key sport. Uh, did your parents play instruments? I mean, did you have music in the home? My dad was a singer, a little, little you know, choir singer, mm. a good tenor. And uh, my mother was, didn't play anything. Huh. I had a sister who played piano very well. My brother was violin for a while, but he didn't, he went on in engineering at Carnegie too. So. Uh, and, and what about yourself? What was. Well, I, you, you know, the, the old system of starting instruments was done by the companies like uh, uh, Kahn and uh, these big companies. And this was Holton had a show in our area. And my sister went to one of them. And she said, I signed you up for an instrument because I didn't want you playing something that everybody else plays. So she signed me up for oboe. <laughs> <laughs> and that's how I got involved. Is that right? And then, of course, at that time, Carnegie Tech was having high school on Saturdays. You go to play in an orchestra and, mm -hmm. and also take a lesson there. And that's what I did. I studied with the, the, the oboe teacher there for four years. And then. Uh, did you enjoy that? I did very much. But then I unfortunately uh, had to give up playing oboe because. Uh, I got a strip throat, and there was a paralysis involved with it, mm. and I couldn't, the air came out through my nose, <laughs> so I had to give up playing. Mm. And I did not play, that's in college now, second year of college, but I didn't get to play oboe then, but I took up timpani at, at the same time, and also had to study other instruments too, and bass fiddle and, all, and clarinet and all, so it, it worked to my advantage in a way because I was gonna be a public school music teacher. So that helped a lot. Mm. So uh, I don't know. I, that that gave me a good break, I think. Yeah. But uh, let's see what would be as next. Well, it was interesting what you said earlier. Um, the uh, the fact that when you were born, you started the war. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> my wife, my mother always said that. <laughs> it's, I think the arch 
Duke was killed the next day. I was shot the next day. And she said, you started the war. <laughs> That's World War I, by the way. <laughs> and, uh, but, uh, it's interesting. Um, the social history that goes along with the progress of the, um, the band instrument, yes. um, yeah. particularly during that time. Yes. Yeah, it would be done by the major companies, and they would come in and give demonstrations mm -hmm. of the instruments. And then you would choose your instrument and then go from there. And they'd offer six, six lessons or something like that, you know. And, and then, well, that's what we did at uh, Progressive Music when we started it. That was the idea. The, the kiddos would take these lessons. We didn't care where they took them or what company they were involved in. Then we would get them for lessons mm. and give them. And we turned out some, not we, but those men did. But I had about 25 of the very best teachers in that area, some wow. from the Pittsburgh Symphony. Wow. So it was very good. And yeah. not only that, at that time too, that might be interesting, we started a, a method of reading, teaching. The, the one thing that we always felt in band was that yeah, I had, a good, had to have a good band that could, the kids could read. Mm. And the Shiners developed a method that you had to read your letter names of the, inst of the uh, piece you were going to play before you, and they'd mark on the side, read, R, and then if the kid did it, he'd mark it off that way, and then if you played it, mark it the other way. Interesting. And that was their teaching method, but oh, they, they turned out students galore who could sight read anything. How did you first meet them? Well, I went to school with Eddie <laughs> at Carnegie, and uh, we, we didn't become close friends, but I admired him as a, an artist. He was a fine trumpet player, too, and an arranger and everything. But then we, when we came back, and I went on, on out, he was the one that recommended me for the job. Is that right? <laughs> Later on. Uh -huh. Wow. And then, of course, he brought, that's how I got Matty, uh, through him, too. Because Matty became a very good friend of mine and, and uh, helpful in many ways. So, yeah, I, I heard that he was a very delightful guy. Yes, and a great trombonist. You know, as I told you, Tommy Dorsey picked him out mm. uh, out of a group, uh, out of a performance in the Stanley Theater in Pittsburgh mm. as a great player. So, so going back just a bit, in your second year of college, you could no longer play. No, and I, what was your next focus? I played timpani. Right. And was lucky because Earl Wilde was there at that time. Oh. And he wrote a ballet. And most of it was, was uh, timpani. <laughs> I mean, uh, it was percussive. And uh, so we performed that. And I, was, I think the Carnegie Orchestra at that time was the first college orchestra ever to play on NBC. Is that right? They brought, they brought their uh, equipment into our a uh, hall there at, at uh, our rehearsal hall at Carnegie that. and uh, made, you know, played, and it was played nationally. Mm. Yeah, I believe that's right. Oh, and by the way, when I went back, finally I was able to breathe okay, and I went back to English horn. So what happened then, the, the uh, director of the orchestra at Carnegie picked on all the numbers that <laughs> had English horn in them. You know, a lot of times they have good oboe players, but they don't have a third person that wants to stay with it. So <laughs> I had to stay with it. And uh, I got to play all the, the, the you know, the, the famous, like New World Symphony, everything mm -hmm. that had an English horn solo in it. Oh, great. <laughs> so that was the, I got back a little bit to playing. Yeah. I had one, I had been second in the state, uh, oh in Ovo at McKeesport, and the man who was number one became the head of the Eastman School of Music, Ovo. And uh, he's written, Sprinkle was his name, and he wrote a method, <laughs> Ovo method. So, so I didn't feel bad getting beat by him. And anyway, he played English horn, and I played Ovo, and I can remember that. <laughs> well, if you get your beat out, that's not a bad guy. Huh? <laughs> no, no, no. Turned out fine. I enjoyed it. I don't know. Well, the, the, the interesting thing about it was the style of music that you played. Yes. I, 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 I wish 
I wish I could have said I knew jazz, but I didn't. But you see, all the men that I got associated with did all kinds of jazz and pop work. That was the good thing. In fact, uh, I was very lucky. I had some very fine players. One boy was a trombone player at McKees, at uh, Wilmerding, Pennsylvania. He went on to NBC as in the, uh, and then, uh, the NBC Orchestra mm. as first trombone. Wow. And uh, then he went on with a jazz band after that. He, oh, I know why. He went, went in the Army and went over to overseas, and they pulled him back from overseas when he found out he was a trombone player, <laughs> and then uh, put him to work in the, on the West Coast there. Tell yeah. us that story about Maddie and the, and the, the Tommy Dorsey Orchestra yeah. about the high note. Yeah, well, I mean, at that time, uh, they always the pit orchestra would start out, and then Tommy would come out, and the, the screen would, or the uh, curtain would open, and the Dorsey band was there, and he'd pick off the top note of the theme, mm. and uh, he he did that one time, and he stopped. He didn't take it, and he pointed to Maddie down in the pit, and he said, "He'll play it for me," and then he did, huh. and they became friends from that on. That's great. But. Uh, I think also some people forget the fact that trombone is not an easy instrument to play. <laughs> no, you have to be accurate, and, st and yet it's a sensitive instrument because you can adjust the pitches. You see, when you have valves, there's nothing you can do about it. You can shake, everybody does everything, but with a trombone, you can alter the pitch all the time and make sure that it's accurate. So if you have a good trombone, you're in good shape. Who, in your opinion, are some of the best uh, trombone players? Oh my, I told you before this, I, I, I am a very forgetful of names, but as I said, I know Matt, I know uh, that uh, San Ernestico was one of the better ones. Yeah. Uh, Tommy Dorsey doesn't really get as much credit oh, as he probably oh no, that's deserves, right. don't you think? That's right. It's a, he's, he, he was, would have been just as good in symphony as he is in jazz. A good trombone player would play anything, that's all. After all, jazz, you have to go one step beyond. If you, you take classical work, go ahead and do it, but go a step beyond because you have to be able to improvise. You know, classical, you know, improvising classical work. So that's a very interesting I, point. I, I yeah. think it, I would encourage anybody Nowadays, you can't tell what, what they're, you don't hear much, much about instruments as much, except guitar, of course. Mm -hmm. that's, uh, that's about the only instrument, although I feel good about that. I used to talk about taking guitar when you're, they used to have tonettes and all that oh, yeah. for kids to learn. I used to say, say, why don't you take up guitar? And they couldn't understand why, and I said, you're using your ear, for goodness sake, not, not anything else. And next of all, it, your hand position is exactly the same as cello. Hmm. <laughs> so it, it worked out. Uh, I had a, good, a lot of good string players from that. Interesting, yeah. And, uh, so how long did you play the timpani? Oh, just that one year. Oh, just that one year? Yeah, well, <laughs> wait a minute, wait a minute. The rest of my time at Carnegie, every year, I, I, I was a regular, I learned to play snare drum then, I had to. Uh, there's, there's one, I'm, I'm ashamed, I can't remember, it's a, it's a number that it has sections like this all the time. And, uh, and it was connected with snare drum. I, I got stuck with that and they took that up and I had to play that. So I, I learned a good bit uh, by, by being ill. I, it was fortunate for me mm. because then I studied with a great, great clarinet teacher at Carnegie in my, from my master's degree. That was the point. Uh, I had to study other instruments too. And this same man was a great teacher. He was, he, t he played in the Pittsburgh Symphony, but he was just a fabulous teacher. Wow. And he took an interest in knowing that I had had my, he had had, had me in, when I was undergraduate as he directed the, the uh, woodwind choir. But uh, he knew I didn't play it at all that. So he took an interest in me then when, we, when I went for my master's and uh, I learned an awful lot. He would, 
teach you and then say, but this is the way you help somebody else. That's a, that's a great teacher. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Did you, uh, during that time, start having a focus on what you wanted to do uh, as a long-time career? Uh, and I'm assuming it was teaching. Well, well, in a sense, by having this studio that we had, we, had, we formed, Eddie and I and Maddie formed this company, and, and Joe Ravella was the third person, uh, not Maddie. Eddie, myself, and Joe Ravella started this, we call it progressive music. And then the idea was to have people come in and take lessons there. That was the whole point. Well, that's where I got interested in, in uh, music and uh, selling. And uh, we'd, we'd go, I'd go out to high schools and talk about uh, getting instruments, you know, to various schools and all. Mm -hmm. So I, I just sort of, got force fed by <laughs> where I live, where I was, what is in. But uh, then I got a chance to, I, I left McKeesport and went to the Gretsch Company in Chicago. And they called the, the job educational director. Nobody knows why, but anyway, that's what they called it. <laughs> and uh, I was there for quite a number of years, but I got to meet, I was selling a band instrument line that nobody knew about. That was a job. Queen on. It's a French make and, and it had good products. Hmm. So uh, I got to go to, uh, to uh, France where it was made and see that and then also go around. And we also had the best piccolo trumpet, the only one really. And so I think I, that's why I have bad ears now. <laughs> Everybody tried to piccolo trumpet and you know whether you know about a piccolo trumpet, it, is a it was a long one. There are short ones too, but this was a long one. And everybody thought, well, I gotta blow the dickens out of that thing. Oh. And they'd blow it loud, and they didn't need to. It's, it's the easiest trumpet to play. It was easier to play than a regular trumpet. Wow. But anyway, not easier, but it was better to not put as much pressure on it, mm -hmm. on yourself. So that, that got me into the, the brass works, you know, and I, then of course, when I went with Yamaha, uh, basically the, they called the job the same thing, but it was, well, like some assistant manager and uh, an educational director, but it was basically the same idea. But I interviewed some of the greatest performers in the business, mm. and I was then trying to get a French horn in a, a good, and one was Johnny Woody I met at uh, the Air Force Band, and he is a, was a great French horn player, and we've been good friends ever since. Hmm. But uh, that, then they were interested in getting their French horn equal to the best. And that's what they, that's the good thing about that company. That's the, that was everything they did, they did it that way. We want it, here's the best, how can we make We've made ours. How close is it to that, or, or what should we do to make it better? Interesting. And that's that didn't happen with a lot of the other band instrument companies. That's what put them where they are. Mm -hmm. That type of thing, and that also that their president uh, Nippon Gaki was the name of the company in Japan, and he was a musician, an organist. Or he, he had a, he ma manufactured an organ first. That was it. So. That's everybody can think see Omaha as a motorcycle company. It's, it, motorcycles really broke off away from the. That's right. You know, away from the music. came first. Yeah, music came first. Yeah. How, what, how did you make the transition between the Gretsch and Yamaha? Did they ask you to come over to Yamaha? Uh, uh, one of my um, salesmen for Gretsch was on the West Coast. And. Uh, he suggested that I do it, but uh, to make the conne make a connection with him. But I went to a NAM or something on the West Coast, a show, and I, I don't know what, what what it was. I went to everything like that, and uh, right across from us was this Yamaha booth with instruments that no, no nobody ever heard of, 
And I started to look at them, and I thought they were pretty good. And then I found out that Reynolds Schilke, the great trumpet man, had, manu had uh, uh, not endorsed Yamaha, but I told them what to do. Mm. He went to Japan and showed them how to set up. So wow. I, I figured that that's a line that somebody should know about. Mm. And then it was my job after that to try get to. I, I met some of the greatest artists in this business. Try our horn. That's all. Mm. But never, we never paid anybody. That's one thing. Never paid a person, but we did pay them when they did. Um, um, would do a test on something, mm. but never, never to say I played this. In fact, we used to, used to call our books users. These are users of our. Uh, oh, interesting. And my, I would take the pictures of those people. And, but uh, we surely learn a lot by oh, listening okay. to those people. Exactly. Some of the greatest, you know, by like, symphonies or jazz people. Uh, Clarinet, I, huh, I can't think of, I told you my mind's going well, but I couldn't think of the gentleman I wanted to know. Uh, he's, he's just as good as Goodman. Oh boy, there's a few of those. There's, yeah, and he was about the second or third right down the lane. Artie Shaw? Uh, no, not Artie Shaw. Artie Shaw was, in this man's opinion, the greatest. Mm. He thought Dorsey was not, <coughs> or not Dorsey, but uh, uh, Goodman. Goodman wasn't quite as good as this guy. Really? And then uh, he said Artie Straw was the greatest. Buddy DeFranco? Buddy DeFranco, that's right. <laughs> he goes, he, we became very close friends and we traveled a lot. And he, there was a gentleman, if you ever saw one, mm. and a, a good clarinetist too. And uh, he helped develop the clarinet, the Yamaha clarinet. And I had to take that around. <laughs> Did he actually have suggestions on how to change it to oh, make it better? Yeah, but well, see, the, the way they, they would do that, the Japanese would find these artists, these people, and call them and take them over to Japan, hmm. to the factory. Let them walk through the factory and uh, try the instruments and then say, what do you think we should do better? And you know, that's the thing that a lot of these artists, when I would do it, they'd sort of so they say, oh, well, okay, I'll do this. But they said, nobody listens to us. And, and it was true, they listened to everything that was said. Now, they didn't always follow that. I mean, do it the way it was, these people say it. But it might be a consensus of what 10 people had said. Mm -hmm. That's the thing. That's what happened in the French horn. As I said, we went everywhere from the airmen of note to the, uh, to the best symphony to anything. Anyone to play French horn, and there were good ones. So, and that French horn that came out, the Yamaha went into some special instruments. They call it the 800 series. It's a way up, not the regular series, but way up for artist series, or whatever called. And that's what the one that I did at that time was developed into the 800 series. Wow. I didn't know that. <laughs> they had made one that, that they liked. And they wanted me to try it. They haven't tried. Who were some of the folks that you worked with over at uh, Gretsch? Duke Kramer was the boss. Mm. Uh, and then, uh, well, most of the others were salesmen. Mm. But I, had, I had control, not control. There was a sales manager, of course. He, he did, But then I had... They would, they would call in to him every day, and then that's Duke Kramer, and they would put the phone over to me, and we'd talk about something about whatever they were interested in or, or what I was interested in at the time. So that was the, was, those were the people. Now, I did go to Fred Gretsch's home hmm. in Long Island, from beautiful, and uh, well, he was a very rich man. They owned them, I, I say, a good part of Manhattan Island. <laughs> and his brother was head of the, of the uh, New England uh, Power, Light and Power Company. Wow. So there was a lot of power in that company. <laughs> power. <laughs> anyway, uh, but the point is that uh, I, I was fortunate enough to deal with these people. 
and see what, what was going on in their minds. Right? And this man, Fred Gretsch, wanted, again, very much like uh, uh, Yamaha, wanted the best, but he also was more business-minded, mm. you know, and profit-minded, too, mm. of course. So, What sort of guy was he? What sort of guy was he? Oh, with me, it was very nice, very. He talked to you on the phone. You know, after all, with guys like that and the money they have, they don't even talk to anybody, really. And, and uh, oh, no, he was very much down to earth. And as I say, he would, when I, he knew I was coming to New York to, uh, to work with their, the company in New York. See, Gretsch had company in New York and in Chicago. I went with the Chicago company. But then Fred was in New York. So uh, when, any, when any of us from Chicago came over there, or at least he'd call and make sure you come and stay at his home. Mm. So uh, and his wife knew the Kennedys. Wow. <laughs> so that's the category he was in, you know. So in fact, uh, there were two great, there's two, they're twins on tennis, on tennis world. Mm -hmm. uh, I cannot think of them. Uh, anyway, I went, <laughs> their sister had a sailboat and, and took me on a road. Um, uh, I mean, I've seen her name on, on a, as a, uh, um, well, she's in, a, oh, come on. Uh, and the name's on the tip of my tongue, but I can't think of it anyway. But uh, by, by meeting these people again, all through Fred. Mm. So uh, I was lucky that way, see? Yeah. So how long were you with uh, Yamaha? Uh, that's another story. <laughs> 13 years with Yamaha huh. in, uh, in the job that I had. And then I resigned. And in fact, they had a big to-do <laughs> when I quit, mm. you know, and gave me a whole lot of gifts and all, and the president was there, the president of, uh, of uh, Yama, of Nippon Gaki was there. It happened to be a big sales meeting uh, at Christmas time, and a lot of, all kinds of people were there, and they gave me, uh, well, Bill Schultz was involved there too, Al. He was there as uh, president, or uh, um, manager mm. at Yamaha. Anyways, he was involved with that too, I know he did. But they gave me like, this is your life and all that kind of <laughs> stuff. And so I was, again, lucky with the people that I met and talked with. So uh, what was your direction after Yamaha? Um, oh, I know. After I quit Yamaha, then they hired me as a consultant. And what I did was travel again all through the country, again, working with the new salespeople. And also, uh, I'm trying to, basically, we had a philosophy. Yamaha had a very, very common philosophy. Never force anything on anybody. Let the people make their own decisions. Mm. That was the basis of it. Mm. It was a soft sell. Mm. That's all it was. And uh, it was my job to tell these men mm. about that. So. That's what I did for 13 more years. <laughs> <laughs> wow. It must have been a very enjoyable run. Oh, I enjoy it very much. Well, tell me about, um, you, you had a store. At Progressive Music. At Progressive Music. Is that where you first met uh, Bill Schultz? Uh, Didn't he I, work for you? Or well, he worked there. Yeah, he, he worked there. He, he took over the, he and a, uh, another fellow that I taught in school took over the repair shop. Oh, okay. A repairman. And they became excellent, both of them, very fine repairmen. Cliff Peterson went on to Ohio and went pretty high up in that field where Bill was more the business person. You know, he was, he was the businessman in the repair area. Mm. He was a good repairman, don't get me wrong, but he was. He had a very good sense of business. And uh, so then, after a while, you know, uh, 
I don't know you know what a demonstration is. That's what they, they go out, and the company goes out and gives them to a, a school, and you're selling the horn. Mm. Well, Bill started doing that with me. The two of us hmm. would go out together, and then, uh, then I think Bill went, first of all, from there to Lion and Healy, as head of their repair, and I was be coming up to Gritch, I'd, Gritch's office, and I'd meet Bill there, and I'd go to his home <laughs> a lot. And then, uh, then when he came back, uh, let's see what we saw, follow that. Anyway, um, Bill, I lost my train of thought now. Well, after he went, Bill was a repairman for Lion and Healy, then what did he do? Oh, he was head of the repair oh, department. He was? Oh, okay. oh, yeah. Oh, he was. And then uh, Bill went, oh, I know. Bill went to Rochester. And that's, Bill went several places there, but Rochester was one of them, and that's where I met Harold Winkler. Oh. And uh, then uh, they didn't get <laughs> that well, and he left and came back to Lion and Healy. Hmm. That was it. So, uh, but that, then after, as I say, I'd go to Bill's home then all the time, and Mary Jane and Bill, they took care of me for five years after I had, I had a divorce in uh, Pittsburgh. And when, when, when I went, it was Gretsch and all. I was in Chicago, and Bill was in Chicago. It was, so that's how we got together all the time. Hmm. And uh, I, I don't know, our paths of, well, actually, uh, that's how I got with out here. Uh, Bill was, well, we were talking on the phone one time, and uh, Doris said, Bill wanted to talk to you. He said, Garbett, get the hell out of here. <laughs> and that, that's what happened. I, uh, <laughs> I came out, and that was the beginning of our of my association with Yamaha, and so <laughs> we've we've been close. And of course, he moved. What he meant was when he said get out here was to, to move here. Hmm. And he, his daughter had already picked out the place that we, and we stayed there. We went, we went there, and she liked the waterfall and all on Via Linda. So that's the place we went to. Wow. And and now Bill lives up in the estates right up the street from us. So oh, wow. We're going out to the evening dinner. So. Oh, how nice. So. Well, it's really a rather amazing um, the relationship that you two guys have. Oh, yeah. It's, it's, I consider my best friend, but hmm. he's going to be younger than I am, but <laughs> <laughs> 10 years younger. More. <laughs> but uh, still, uh, I missed having him in school by one year. I came into McKee's Ford the year he and his wife graduated. Oh, is that right? I came in in whatever year it was, and they had graduated previous to that. Hmm. But we both had the good fortune of studying with a man by the name of Stribney, who was a great, great teacher hmm. and a good violinist. Uh, didn't, wouldn't be looked at in a sense of greatness today in a sense that he, he just taught and, and played violin very well. He played in the string quartet very well and, and Yost string quartet in Pittsburgh, but he, uh, he did not meet the public as much. Hmm. But that was the point I learned from that, you know, saw that work when I played it uh, in the case for it. But he was instrumental in getting me to go to, I went to the National High School uh, National High School Orchestra and the uh, Eastern High School Orchestra, hmm. you know, so, and he, he's the one that suggested to go. You had a, that, you remember when they had the national, you wouldn't remember that. They used to have a national every other year oh. and then a regional the other year hmm. of the so-called best players ever in midst, but uh, great conductors. Guy Fraser Harrison, oh, oh, Reiner, <laughs> wow, oh, a lot of people. Unbelievable, yeah. So, I, I, I got to sit in the orchestra that, <laughs> so I was playing oboe then. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, that they had state contests then too. 
University of Pittsburgh call it the forensic leg. Mm. And so I used to take part in those. When you left Progressive, did it close or did you sell no, it? Oh, no. I sold my stock oh. to uh, Tony Petroselli, I believe, uh, from Wilmerding, a good teacher who made, I think that was the way it was. I don't know, but I know I sold my stock. Mm. I remember what I did. They gave it to me $100 a month at the time. <laughs> it went on for years, but that's, <laughs> but it was, uh, all I wanted out of it was what I put in it. That's mm. all. That's what I asked for, and that's what I got. So by that time, Maddie was involved in it, too. But uh, Progressive has turned on some great people. Mm. Uh, well, as I say, there were two or three of us that went on into national things that right. from there. But uh, they have students galore that are all over the country teaching them in. Mm -hmm. So, what do you think were some of the the larger contributions that Yamaha made during the time that you were there? Well, truly, I. Th I think their attention to the best. I think that was a, a definite contribution. Hmm. And uh, oh, they were, gave some scholarships to. They gave me charge of that. I had to pick the people at the colleges. So that's another thing I got to deal with the, the top person in the college, uh, and ask them who would uh, be deserving of an instrument, you know, we get, we give them a free instrument and take their picture, hmm. that's all. But it was just, uh, it's more to, to promote music. I would say their greatest contribution is what they have done for the for music itself hmm. in the world. Because they have, you know, the piano is one of the best. I mean, uh, they're, in fact, they're, they're uh, big, Great large piano compares very favorably with the sideway. Mm -hmm. In fact, John, our president at Yamaha, left there and went to you know, Steinway as the head of the, he and Bill, well, it was another company owned Steinway at that time, a major company, and they all worked together. Mm. So. CBS, but, was it? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. CBS, that's right. And, uh, but that was, Steinway was, a secondary part of that thing. Mm -hmm. But the Steinway grant is still the greatest, but the Yamaha made a grant, uh, it's t what is it, eight or ten foot grant, yeah. it's, it's big. It's not the, the house piano, that's not, not it. Right. But they were famous for that. Mm -hmm. Most definitely. And there were some great pianists, that, or pianists, whatever you want to say, uh, who used that piano as an artist, as artists. So, so after your uh, 13 years as a consultant, mm -hmm. what what was your direction after that? Quit. Retirement. <laughs> Quit. <laughs> and enjoy it. <laughs> no, I have. And I haven't. Uh, I decided then and there. I had done what I wanted to do, and uh, I enjoyed it, but I wasn't going to fool around and try to get. Uh, I think that was in ninety. 94 or something like that. That's plenty of time. I had spent 26 years actually with Yamaha, 13 and 13. Wow. That was enough. I mean, not enough, but I mean, and not even that. These younger people have so many, they're so much smarter than we are. These, I, I admire them all so much. Now, when you were with uh, Yamaha, did you have the occasion of working or knowing uh, People like Kawakami? Yes. I mean, my wife and I had dinner with him. Oh, is that right? At his home. Huh. And his wife, and my, she had a, his wife had a beautiful ring. And we sent a number on the, in his gardens, that's where, and Doris admired it. And she took it off and put it on Doris. And then uh, Kawakami said, you should buy her one. I should have said, 
yeah, pay me and I will. <laughs> but I never did. But, uh, I, I can remember that. He said, you should buy her one. Like that. Yeah. Boy, he had a, he had a, oh, an estate you wouldn't believe. Mm. Swans and everything like that. Wow. And then, he was a great man. Well, he was another guy dedicated to the industry, wasn't he? Oh, yes. Oh, he, he was dedicated to music, mm. period. And, uh, I would guess that that's what, I don't know that as many people as uh, a few of us knew him as, as they did, uh, you know, now. Oh, yeah. They don't know who he is or, but, uh, oh, another thing that uh, I've been very fortunate with, one of the brightest men who worked with Yamaha when I was there, was Mr. Takagi, he was the assistant top man. Mm. He was always, he was the man with the fi uh, figures and knew all the, the money side. The other man was a, an outgoing man, Kawashima was his name, and he was very bright too, but the point is, there were two of them, and they went together over to Nippongaki as heads of Nippongaki. Wow. And then they came back here, and now Mr. Takagi calls me and we talk and we go to when we go to the West Coast, we always have go to his home. Is that right? Where does he live? In uh, it's Fullerton now. Wow. But uh, you see, it's so lucky that you get to in your lifetime to meet such great people. And, and he was truly a very great brain. He's written books, and uh, he has a, a son and a daughter now in this country working in the music business, but I don't know what and what. But uh, and I get a letter from him, a card from him, and at Christmas time we exchange cards, there's always a little note on it, you know. And mm. As I say, when we went to the coast, he invited us down to his home. In fact, he came and got us and <laughs> took us down. <laughs> so. Well, yeah. in addition to some of the great people that you have um, talked about, and I would agree with you that you know, this industry seems to be full of wonderful people. Oh. Well, are there any others that come to mind that you really have considered either mentors or people who are real icons? Uh, in the industry, I mean? Yeah. Uh, you know, I wish I could, there would have to be a lot. Uh, I visited Zaff's music. That's where we've been out to in Philadelphia. Mm. And there, the father, Eric is the son now, but the father was a, one of the beginning guys that, that helps make the industry. I mean, the, this was the, uh, just the, the uh, not the wholesale part, but the retail part. Right. Yeah. You know, and then uh, there was one in Boston, for goodness sake. Uh, he was a great performer in his lifetime, and I can't. I wish I could remember these names like that. That was another influence on me. Hmm. He was, uh, let's see. And <laughs> funny thing is, our competitor in Pittsburgh was Volkwein's always. We were the little company and they were the big one. But since that, Walter Volkwein, uh, we both belonged to ABA, American Bandmasters. And uh, he, we'd talk after him because we were both in Pittsburgh, hmm. but he remember, and we became good friends. Now he's dead now, but mm -hmm. still, his wife still writes us. Uh, mm. you know, so I learned more about the industry from those people too. You know, just meeting them mm. and competing with them was a good thing. Mm -hmm. uh, but there was one in in New York, Manny's, but. Uh, there was another one near Manny's. Ash? Sam, Sam Ash, yeah. I got to see all of them. Wow. There were, uh, that was, uh, there was another, there were two or three Ashes in there right. involved. And, uh, yeah, Jerry and. Jerry, yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh, oh, I know, one in, Philip, or in Washington, for goodness sake. His son's running it now. See, in Washington? Washington, D.C. Uh, Chuck Levin? Chuck Levin, yeah. Chuck and I got along real well. We used to talk and 
you know, Chuck he was, was a real pioneer. Ah, but he was not a, he was, took no prisoners, you know what I mean? He said what he thought. And he knew I said that, what I thought. And, and we got along. We talked on the phone. And he used to say, too many of them were giving me, you know what? <laughs> and uh, he said, you're, I know you're, when you tell me something, you mean it and you don't, uh, you're not bragging about it. But if I told him a product was good, he was one of the very best people to put Yamaha horns out. Mm. Now, the bad thing was he put them out on bid all the time and Chuck won every bid he ever en entered because mm. he put the price so low and you don't like to do that, like to see that happen if you can help it. Simply, I mean, from a, from a wholesale standpoint, it sort of reduces your, it does two things. It gets your product into the schools and he was bending out of the country. That was another thing. That's where we were. He was about in Puerto Rico and all that. And we were having, we had dealers, not we did, but Yamaha had dealers all over the world. And they were yelling, what's this Chuck Lemon doing? He's meeting us from on bids. <laughs> so, but I understood him. And he was, he has a son now that's running it. He had yeah, two sons. Right. He had two sons. And his wife was just as bright as he was. She was. She sat right up there when his, when he was running the business. She was watching over the finances. She knew what she was doing. Wow. She's a very beautiful lady too. Yeah. So. What do you think the key to his success was? Well. I don't know. I I would guess that it was his knowledge of. Uh, not so much, the instruments as his knowledge of business. That he sold something, he was always selling something, and, and uh, very capably. But he, he also had a, a keen sense of observation of people. Not that I would always agree with him, but when he said something about somebody, I thought, well, boy, I can see how how he thinks that way. Mm. But see. He, a lot of people identify Chuck because he was close to the New York group. Right. That was a New York, Washington group that tried to control everything. You know that. And uh, man, he's in all of them. And he was, they counted him as part of them. And in the industry, a lot of people in the industry disliked that New York gang. I don't know, because it was, they weren't doing anything wrong, but they were, Controlling your business outside of the, their area, mm, yeah. and underselling everybody too, because <laughs> they were getting special prices. There's no doubt about it. That's uh, the uh, might be interesting. The company that uh, this man that I told you about that came around and sold instruments for that I went over for him was from Holton. They started that, but Con became a very big uh, company as far as uh, developing the industry. I mean, the music field. Yeah, most definitely. The con was a big help. And uh, I got to visit their factory a lot of time, met their top people. Hmm. In fact, we were the first store that ever did that. We took our better teachers out the con factory, and Selmer said, "Oh, you're coming here." So we got, so we went to the Selmer and Con factory, wow. and then these guys looked through. And I, now they're doing that all the time. And I think we were the first company that ever did that. I don't know, hmm. but it was new to them. But uh, it was great because these people saw how the instruments were made, right. and the care and all, and, wow. and it made uh, made our job better because you talk Con now, you you know you're talking. It had, it, they had leadership back then. Mm. I don't know what they have now. Mm. That's very interesting, yeah. But they had real leadership and, uh, and, and seemed to understand that, I don't know, maybe they're still, maybe they're, King, King was another company that mm. I admired, but I had nothing to do with King. But Matty played the King Dramon. <laughs> <laughs> and I had to switch him to, to play the con later, but actually he was always a king 
they have this picture all over, and they call it, they call it Matty Motto. Well, oh, is that right? Yeah, and it's, uh, so that's why I guess with the Salmon Estico got that one too. But uh, they, they were great for trombones anyway, mm. King was. And I don't think Kwan was, Kwan had a great bass trombone, but not, not a fabulous tenor trombone, you know, mm. so. When did you um, meet uh, Harold? Hmm. Um, I mean, did you guys I ever work together? No, no. Yeah, I know. Uh, a guy that worked for us, uh, Ben Hiller, he was a guitarist in Tommy Dorsey's orchestra. Hmm. He was a great man, and he worked for Grant. And uh, he said, they are opening a store in Rochester uh, called Harlow. And uh, he said, I'm going up there, and I think you should go along. So I can remember meeting them. In fact, our famous story with when his wife was alive, I opened a bottle of uh, champagne or something, and the cork hit the ceiling and made a little dent in the ceiling. <laughs> and, uh, I can remember that. They talk about that. but. Uh, <laughs> That was, uh, that's where I met him. Mm. And uh, Harold had a good reputation then uh, in uh, that type of work, but uh, he was promoting his own line, though. Mm. And of course, <laughs> we were promoting against it, naturally. <laughs> but uh, I don't know whether he took, uh, well, it regrets to see when, when I met him, and then Heller, I don't know what he did after that. But Bill worked for him there. Oh, is that right? Oh, for a short time. Yeah, for a short time. They couldn't get along. Oh, is that what it was? Yeah. I mean, that's Bill's side of it. Yeah. Uh, Harold was dictatorial, you know, and, and uh, I don't know what Harold's side was. I don't remember. He didn't say anything. But Harold's wife was a beautiful lady. She was not, not pretty, that is what I mean, but she was a beautiful person. And he, uh, he was lucky. And then she died recently. So, mm -hmm. But uh, I think that's how, I don't know how we became, uh, he used to work for LeBlanc part time. And he came down to my store in McGeesport to promote LeBlanc products with uh, the head of LeBlanc. Pascucci? Uh, yeah, Pascucci, you know? Vito. They came down together, mm -hmm. and, and I, they talked to me at Pittsburgh about handling the line and all that. I can remember that, but Harold was instrumental in that. I think Harold had some kind of a divisional job with LeBlanc. You know, I think he op tried to open stores around that those state, that tri-state area. I think that was it. Hmm. So, but I don't think I ran into Harold again. I don't know until. Heroes, probably. Hmm. I, I can't say that, but we became very close friends with uh, he and his wife. Hmm. So I I like Harold, and but you have to understand him. If you don't understand him, he's he's ridiculous. But he knows he knows what he's talking about. But he tries to he, he forces his opinion, I think, on people. Or, or has no patience with the people that don't share his opinion. I think that's basically hmm. Harold's. But he's a great man, really. And uh, as far as the business, as far as the industry is concerned, right. he's, he's done right. a lot of good for them. What were your thoughts um, when your good friend Bill Schultz got involved with Fender? Well, I thought it was great, but uh, I couldn't, you know, I, I couldn't see. I always felt Bill's home was band instruments. That was the point, mm -hmm. and that surprised me. But uh, I knew, having gone through that other tune with uh, CBS, you know, and all that, I knew his interest had become something as another direction. But then I knew when he took it over that that it would be done right, mm -hmm. and and it hadn't been done as well before Bill took it over. It. It going along and on a level, but
but not on a level that we started at. Um, Leo Fender and his wife and all, but Bill went back mm. and, and found out some things about that and how they wanted to go. And he, but he developed a, their marketing thing. That's, Bill did a fabulous job with marketing. And uh, I'm, I'm very proud of him. I think he's done fine over the years. But uh, I look at him as, a, see he played football for my, our high school. Hmm. And he played, bar his wife played baritone horn and he played tenor sax in the, in, my, in the McKee Sport Band. He played tenor sax? Yeah. I didn't know that. Clarinet and tenor sax. But he played that, and they played that, and then they left. Like 70, what is it, 73, and I came in in 73 or something like that. But I came in in the spring, and they left in the, they had already left. I mean, I came in the fall, they had left in the spring. So that's how I miss teaching them, that's all. Hmm. But, uh, We've been very close here, and they've been there. He was the one that said, get the hell over here <laughs> to, to, uh, to come here. Mm. And you've liked it ever since. Oh, yes. In fact, uh, his daughter, the same daughter who called us and told us to come over originally, lives a couple of doors away from us. Oh, wow. They both have homes in that estates. It's called an estates up there. And uh, uh, she, Karen, his daughter, and I used to, when I used to go to Bill's home, they were near uh, the uh, race racetrack. Rose, I think it's Roseville. Anyway, I on Friday nights I go out there and I take Karen and I and we go to the races. And <laughs> <laughs> the poor kid, she she just sat there and that's all. But she like we we got along real well together. And, well, you have definitely had a long and rich career in music. What, what, looking back at all of that, how does it make you feel? Well, I, I feel bad that I never went on to perform. You know, I feel bad about that. But I feel worse now. Oh, I, I feel great about the things that I've encountered. But I feel bad now that I'm not involved in anything in music. I don't even go to the symphony, and I should. My, my daughter's talking about the Jacksonville Symphony. She's tied up with it, and my ex-wife is tied up with the, the Symphony Society in Pittsburgh and the Opera Society and all that. Uh, but uh, hmm. but uh, I'm not involved. And it's, I can... Maybe maybe it's because I've enjoyed as much as I do. I like to listen to good music. In fact, I like. Do you listen to those uh, the nine hundred series of uh, on? Uh, oh yeah, right. I'm watching there. Uh, nine twenty-seven, nine twenty-six. Uh, yeah. I listen to the. All, we we need that every night. We turn that on and listen to that. Yeah, me too. There's some um, some good things in there, mm -hmm. and they must have been the ones that. It's, it's English. So there must have been the ones that the Americans didn't try to produce because they, they couldn't have afforded to pay these people, right. pay the royalties. Yeah, that's a good point. But the English, they did in England, they didn't have to pay any royalties. That's the way I figured. Mm. And how many children do you have? Three. Mm. And, uh, none in music. One, one started in flute. Uh, one of my students from Walmart England was Joe Kreisick, great violinist, and he took my job at McKeesport huh. later on as band director. And my little girl, my one daughter, he made her play oboe. He knew I, he, I had played oboe, and he, he made her play it. So I gave her a few lessons, and she played. She used, used wrong fingerings, on, uh, and he got away with it. She had a great ear. That was the point. Mm. But. Uh, the other one, other daughter, took cello for a year and flute for a summer, but she didn't want to. Now she, they go, they go to the symphony. She and her husband go to the symphonies in, in uh, Houston, and uh, so all three of them. Well, no, uh, my one daughter in Philadelphia 
tied up with Johnson and Johnson. She has a real good job, and she teaches. She's again teaching people how to. They have people that go all over the country and all over the world, and she used to do it. Now she's teaching people how to do that, whatever it is, uh, to produce their. Uh, they have centers or whatever it is. And, right, right. Yeah, and she has. Uh, she did that. So she's tied with them. So all three are doing well, I think. Mm. Well, one daughter in Jacksonville lost her husband. Uh, mm. uh, he died a couple of years ago. And was a uh, Green Beret, you know. Mm. Mm. So he, he developed problems like that. And my, my present wife, this is our sec her second marriage, her first wife, her uh, first husband died of uh, malaria, and he got in uh, Philippines, you know. Wow. So, but we were married, and it's an odd thing there, we, we were married, and uh, neither of us were looking for anybody. <laughs> That's the point, you know. Yeah. It had been five years since I'd been divorced, and I was, I was having a good time on the road and enjoying myself, but not looking. And uh, she was, the same way, and we were both, we were at Las Vegas, and I'm talking to this person on this side is her, and behind her is her, f no, on this side is her mother, and behind her is her father. I didn't know this, of course, <laughs> but we're talking, and typically me, I'm telling her how to play, and she'd been playing for years, <laughs> you know. So at any rate, I asked her, let's have a drink or something, and that's, we were married in six months of mine. Wow. Were very, that was a very, very, very fortunate meeting for me. Mm -hmm. We were at Aladdin, the opening of Aladdin. Oh. This, her parents had happened to be there simply because she stopped there because it was close to the airport. But uh, they were coming just to visit her there. Mm. And that's what all happened. 